behalf of African people for the Honorable Marcus Garvey. Listen to this. The death of Malcolm's uncles had been the primary impetus to his father being willing to risk his own life to spread the Garvey message. Malcolm describes a typical UNIA meeting. Listen, brothers and sisters. This is Malcolm X talking about life in the Garvey movement as a child. Because some of y'all think Malcolm X didn't have no black consciousness until he got out of jail. Some of y'all think Malcolm X didn't have any consciousness until he got out of jail. Well, if that's the case, listen to this quote. Malcolm X describes a typical UNIA Garvey meeting to which his father would take him. Malcolm says, quote, I can remember hearing of Adam driven out of the garden into the caves of Europe, Africa for the Africans, Ethiopia awake. And my father would talk about how it would not be much longer before Africa would be completely run by African people. By black men was the phrase that my father would use. No one knows when the hour of Africa's redemption cometh, it will be here. Malcolm X continues, quote, I remember seeing big shiny photographs of Marcus Garvey that were passed around from hand to hand. My father had a big envelope of them that he always took to those meetings. The picture showed what seemed to me millions of blacks thronged in the parade behind the Honorable Marcus Garvey riding in a fine car. A big black man dressed in a dazzling uniform with gold braid on it, and he was wearing a thrilling hat with tall plumes. Malcolm X goes on. I remember hearing that he had black followers, not only in the United States, but all around, all around the world. And I remember how the meetings always closed with my father saying several times and the people chanting after my father, up, up, you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. Those are the words of Malcolm X as he remembers growing up as a child and Marcus Garvey's UNIA, and Malcolm X, the last year of his life, would return to the teachings of the most honorable Marcus Garvey when he started the organization of Afro-American unity to organize American Africans and tie us into the African Union on the continent. You don't want to go there with me. The question isn't, who was a Garveyite? The question is, who wasn't a Garveyite? The question isn't, who did Marcus Garvey influence? The question is, who didn't Marcus Garvey influence? The name of the book is Garvey's Children by Tony Sewell. <coughs> the name of the book is Garvey's Children. Let's go back because we're not done. Let's finish with the Garvey divisions in America. Indiana, 13 divisions of the Garvey movement. Alabama, 11 divisions of the Garvey movement. Connecticut, 10 divisions of the Garvey movement. Maryland, 10 divisions of the Garvey movement. Tennessee, nine divisions of the Garvey movement. Texas, nine divisions of the Garvey movement. Kentucky, eight divisions of the Garvey movement. Kansas, seven divisions of the Garvey movement. Massachusetts, seven division, divisions of the Garvey movement. Colorado, three divisions of the Garvey movement. Arizona, four divisions of the Garvey unit. Delaware, three divisions of the Garvey unit. Washington, three divisions of the Garvey unit. Iowa, two divisions of the Garvey unit. Columbia, Washington, D.C., two divisions of the Garvey movement. Nebraska, one division. Oregon, one division. Utah, one division. Wisconsin, one division. I'm not done. Let's talk about the Caribbean islands. I'm not done. After today, you're comparing Garvey to nobody. Let's go to the Caribbean. Let's go to the Caribbean. 
Cuba, 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 Cuba. 52 divisions of Marcus Garvey's organization in the island of Cuba. 52 divisions of Marcus Garvey's movement in Cuba. Panama, 47 divisions of Garvey in Panama. Trinidad, 30 divisions of Garvey in Trinidad. Time out. Stokely Carmichael Kwame Ture. Time out. Stokely Carmichael Kwame Ture. Time out. Stokely Carmichael Kwame Ture. Although he was a pan-African socialist and not a pan-African nationalist, he was from Trinidad. Do you not believe that some of those Garvey roots in Trinidad did not inspire Stokely Carmichael who reintroduced the phrase black power? Black power didn't come from Stokely. It came from Garvey. Stokely reintroduced Garvey's phrase, black power. Canada, 15 divisions of Garvey in Canada. Jamaica, 11 divisions. The UNIA finally took root in Jamaica. Once the fire was lit in America, the Caribbean jumped on. 11 divisions in Jamaica. Honduras, 7 divisions of Garvey. South Africa, 8 divisions of Garvey. How many of you knew? How many of you knew? That when the African National Congress was founded in South Africa, there were Garveyites involved in the founding of the ANC. And that John Dube, John Dube, one of the early leaders of the ANC, shout out to my South African brothers and sisters. I was supposed to be with you last June for the anniversary of the Soweto student uprising, but COVID canceled that. Shout out to all my South African brothers and sisters. Johannesburg, I love you. Soweto, I love you. Kailisha, I love you. KwaZulu, I love you. Durban, I love you. Cape Town, I love you. Zulus, I love you. Kosa, I love you. Swazi, I love you. Shout out to all my South African brothers and sisters. When the ANC was founded, there were Garveyites involved in the founding of the ANC. Robert Sabukwe, who founded the Pan-African Congress. Robert Sabukwe, one of my greatest heroes, who was the mentor to Steve Biko. Robert Sabukwe, who was Steve Biko's mentor, was a Garveyite. Stop playing with me. Stop playing with me. Is Garveyism or get away from me? Is Garveyism or get away from me? It's Pan-Africanism or perish. It is Pan-Africanism or perish. You ask me about East Africa? Shout out to Kenya. You ask me about East Africa? Did you know that Jomo Kenyatta, Jomo Kenyatta, one of the independence leaders of Kenya, met Marcus Garvey as a child in London. Jomo Kenyatta used to go listen to Marcus Garvey speak in London as a child, my brothers and sisters. As a child, Jomo Kenyatta used to go sit at Garvey's feet in London. Marcus Garvey is the father of African independence. Let's keep going. British Guyana. Seven divisions. Colombia, six divisions. Dominican Republic, five divisions of Garvey. Guatemala, five divisions. Barbados, four divisions of Garvey. British Honduras, four divisions of Garvey. Mexico, four divisions of Garvey. Sierra Leone, three divisions of Garvey. England, two divisions of Garvey. Ghana, two divisions of Garvey. Liberia, two divisions of Garvey. Bahamas, two divisions of Garvey. Panama, Southwest Africa, two divisions. Wales, one division. Antigua had a division. Australia had a division. Bermuda had a division. Brazil had a division. Dominica had a division. Ecuador had a division. Grenada, rest in peace to Maurice Bishop. Grenada, rest in peace to Maurice Bishop. Grenada, rest in peace to Maurice Bishop, had a division. Haiti, Haiti had a division. Nevis a division, Nigeria a division. Speaking of Nigeria, Nanambi Ezekiel, 
Nanam Diazika Wayne, one of the independence fighters of Nigeria, went to school with Kwame Nkrumah in Philadelphia, Lincoln University, where they used to come to the Garvey meetings in Philadelphia. Kwame Nkrumah and Nanam Diazika Wayne, the leaders of an independent Nigeria and the leaders of an independent Ghana, went to school right here in Philadelphia and they were members of the Garvey movement right here in Philadelphia. Puerto Rico, a division. St. Kitts, a division. St. Lucia, a division. St. Thomas, a division. St. Vincent, a division. Venezuela, a division. And guess what? And guess what, brothers and sisters? Guess what? These are not all of them. These are not all of them. These are not all of them. Why don't we have all the divisions listed? Why don't we have all the divisions listed? Because being a member of the Garvey movement was so controversial, so politically incorrect, that a lot of Garveyites had to hide their identity so they wouldn't go to jail. Garveyism was banned in a lot of African colonies. The Garvey newspaper was banned throughout Africa and in many Caribbean islands. If you got caught with the Negro World newspaper, if you got caught with the Negro World newspaper, you could go to jail, you could be killed, you could lose your job. That's how powerful Garvey was. Let's understand something. Let's understand something. When Garvey starts the UNIA in 1914 in Jamaica, when Garvey starts the UNIA in 1914 in Jamaica, World War I was just getting underway. When World War I ends in 1918, we're at the early years of Garvey in America. When World War I ends in 1918, we're at the early years of Garvey in America. Black men are coming home from the war. Black men are coming home from the war. And when black men come home from World War II, they walk straight into the red hot summer of 1919. The red hot summer of 1919, race riots all over America. Why were there so many race riots during the red hot summer of 1919? Because black men had went to Europe to fight for America. Black men had went to Europe to fight for America and get back home and they can't find a job. Get back home, they got to deal with the Ku Klux Klan. Get back home, they got to deal with police brutality. So we decided we weren't going to take it no more and we started fighting back. And Marcus Garvey was a central figure in the red summer of 1919 because he told black men, Marcus Garvey is the father of black masculinity. Marcus Garvey is the father of black masculinity. Marcus Garvey is the father of black masculinity. He told black men, give up your wishbone and get a backbone. Marcus Garvey said, give up your wishbone and get a backbone. Marcus Garvey said, give up your wishbone and get a backbone. Brothers and sisters of other organizations, I welcome you. Please don't get disrespectful. Please don't get disrespectful because the leader of your organization was a Garveyite too. The leader of your organization was a Garveyite too. I'm going to come to that. I'm going to come to that. Your whole organization was copied off of Garveyism. Don't be disrespectful. If it wasn't for Marcus Garvey, your leader would have never existed. Your organization would have never existed. Don't go there with me. I got the receipts. Don't go there with me. I got the receipts. All y'all come from Garvey. Don't hate. Don't hate. All y'all come from Garvey. Don't hate. Not one of you did not. All of y'all came from Garvey, but y'all don't want to give them no credit. Because if you tell people about Garvey, they wouldn't need y'all. 
If you tell people about Garvey, they wouldn't need y'all. Don't go there with me. You don't want to go there with me. I'll make you cry. I'll make you cry. So now, brothers and sisters, Garvey stays in New York. When Garvey gets to New York, guess who he goes to visit? When Garvey gets to New York, guess who he goes to visit? When Garvey gets to New York, guess who he goes to visit? He goes to visit W.E.B. Du Bois at the NAACP crisis office. This is when Garvey first gets to America, March of 1916. He goes to visit Du Bois because he heard, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois was a Pan-Africanist. <laughs> He's 20 years older than Marcus Garvey, so he's old enough to be Marcus Garvey's father. So Marcus Garvey says, I'm going to go and visit my elder Pan-Africanist, W.E.B. Du Bois. But when he got there, Marcus Garvey was not impressed. Marcus Garvey said that when he walked into the NAACP office, I think he said uh, the darkest thing in the office was W.E.B. Du Bois. He said it was all white folks and super light, bright black folks. He said nobody in there was dark skinned. And that's why those of you who know the history of the NAACP, and by the way, I have nothing against my light brothers and sisters. Okay, and Pan African is everybody equal light skinned, dark skinned, nappy hair, straight hair. If you're African, you're African. The point that I'm making, the point that I'm making is that W.E.B. Du Bois was a light skinned supremacist. W.E.B. Du Bois was a light-skinned supremacist. And what a lot of you guys don't understand, his talented tenth was the comeback to Marcus Garvey, mass black organization. W.E.B. Du Bois' talented tenth was the comeback for Marcus Garvey's mass black organization. W.E.B. Du Bois' talented tenth, that was going to be a light-skinned, Bourgeoisie. W.E.B. Du Bois thought that the light-skinned black bourgeoisie should lead the race. He was an uppity Negro. Yes, he was Pan-Africanist. Yes, he was intelligent. But he was a jealous Negro. Let me say something to y'all. And I respect W.E.B. Du Bois. I pour libations at his grave whenever I go to Ghana. But let us understand. I want to clear this up. No, don't say F him. He's an ancestor. Don't you do that? And he did make his contribution. What he did to Garvey was wrong. What he did to Garvey was wrong. But we don't throw away no ancestors. We appreciate the good. We learn from the bad. I will still respect W.E.B. Du Bois for his contribution to Pan-Africanism and African scholarship. Let me be clear. Let me be clear, because I'm going to give credit where credit is due. Let me be clear. W.E.B. Du Bois is the father of sociology. I'm going to say it again. W.E.B. Du Bois, more than any white sociologist ever, W.E.B. Du Bois basically reinvented and elevated the study of social problems in America. He is the father of American sociology. Give credit where credit is due. Give credit where credit is due. With that being said, he was jealous of Garvey. Let me explain W.E.B. Du Bois' jealousy of Garvey. Let me explain W.E.B. Du Bois' jealousy of Garvey. W.E.B. Du Bois had an issue with Booker T. That man and W.E.B. Du Bois didn't get along. Because W.E.B. Du Bois, being the light-skinned supremacist that he was, being the black bourgeoisie talented 10th Negro that he was, he didn't understand the importance of Booker T. Washington saying, we got to teach our people how to use their hands and build their own homes and build their own banks and build their own schools and build their own supermarkets. When Booker T. Washington was talking about black industrialization, when Booker T. Washington was talking about black industrialization, W.E.B. Du Bois kept worrying about being accepted by white folks. Booker T. Washington said, what good is a vote? Booker T. Washington told W.E.B. Du Bois, what good is a vote if our people don't have a job? What good is a vote 
if you can't take care of your family? What good is a vote if you don't have your own business? What good is a vote if we ain't got our own hospitals? We ain't got our own schools. Booker T understood what W.E.B. Du Bois was saying, and they were both Pan-Africanist. Booker T and W.E.B. were both Pan-Africanist. Booker T understood what W.E.B. was saying, but he said, you putting the cart before the horse. Politics don't control money. Money control politics. So Booker T was trying to get W.E.B., Booker T was trying to get W.E.B. to understand until the black man can take care of his family, build a house with his hands. Having the right to vote means nothing. And I think black America can see today. I think black America can see today. That Booker T, they were both right. You need economic power. You need political power. They were both right. You need economic power and political power, but Booker T was more right because he understood that the economic power creates the political. Booker T was more right because he understood that the economic power creates the political power, brothers and sisters. See, Booker T, excuse me, W.E.B. Du Bois felt that after Booker T. died, he had a right to be the leader of black America. W.E.B. Du Bois felt Frederick Douglass is gone. Booker T. Washington is gone. I should be king. W.E.B. Du Bois felt Frederick Douglass is gone. Booker T. Washington is gone. I should be king. So W.E.B. Du Bois with his doctorate from Harvard and all his degrees, he felt that now that Booker T is gone, I should be the new leader. I should be the new leader. Booker T dies in 1915. Garvey shows up in 1916. Marcus Garvey prevents W.E.B. Du Bois. Marcus Garvey prevents unintentionally W.E.B. Du Bois from becoming the new HNIC. W.E.B. wanted to be the new HNIC. W.E.B. wanted to be the new HNIC. He said, Douglas is gone. Booker T is gone. I'm the new king. And right before he ascended the throne of black leadership in America, right before W.E.B. Du Bois ascended the throne of black leadership in America. A nappy head Jamaican got off a banana boat. A nappy head Jamaican got off a banana boat. A nappy head Jamaican by the name of Marcus Garvey got off a banana boat and said, Up, you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. And that black man from Jamaica organized more black people than any leader in any organization you've ever seen since and he did not have to use a religion to do it i'm gonna repeat it twice right before du bois became the leader garvey shows up off the banana boat and marcus garvey starts speaking in harlem and he's organizing and energizing and motivating black people in a way no leader had done since douglas garvey said up you mighty race you can accomplish what you will. And that made the boy sit down. Garvey didn't have no Harvard degree and he didn't need it. Garvey didn't study in Berlin and he didn't need it. Garvey didn't come from Fisk and he didn't need it. Garvey wasn't mixed race and he didn't need it. And Garvey was able to build like no black man has ever built. And because of that, W.E.B. Du Bois got jealous. W.E., my great-grandfather was Cuban. My great-grandfather was Cuban. Cuba was the most thoroughly organized Garvey Island in the Caribbean. My great-grandfather was Cuban. Cuba was the most thoroughly organized Garvey Island in the Caribbean. And W.E.B. Du Bois never forgave Garvey. W.E.B. Du Bois 
never forgave Garvey for taking his place on the leadership ladder. See, we have to talk about the HNIC syndrome amongst black men. We have to talk about the HNIC syndrome amongst black men. We have to talk about the HNIC syndrome amongst black men. Okay? And for you coons up in here, my ancestor Frederick Douglass was born in slavery. You understand me? Enslaved Africans on all four of my family trees. Enslaved Africans on all four of my family trees. But I'm not into what y'all into. I don't care about none of them groups y'all belong to. All these anti-African groups. We want to identify with slavery, but we don't want to identify with Africa. You Negroes are stupid. And you following stupid people. You're, you're stupid and you're following stupid people. I don't want to identify with Africa. I want to identify with slavery. Those movements are trash. But I'm not going to convince you. I don't have to convince you. Because black America has been down that road before. This is nothing new. Those two fake groups that were started by YouTube opportunists, those groups ain't taking you nowhere. The leaders of neither one of them are doing anything in the streets for black people. They're not even leaders. This is YouTube opportunists. They not. They have never done anything for the black community. Nothing. They just think they can get some money by telling you don't be proud to be black. They think you can get some money by telling you you don't come from Africa. They think they're going to help get you some reparations by telling you to hate the root of the tree. If you hate the root, you hate the whole tree. You hate Africa. You hate yourself, you fools. But I'm not going to convince you. Because we've already been down that way. We've already, black America has already went through this. We're going to act like we're not from Africa. We've been through that and it's gotten you nowhere. And it's never going to get you nowhere. Because if you understand anything about international relations, you have to understand that you must have allies. You got to have allies. You got to have allies. And I'm not giving up my biological allies in Africa. I'm not giving up my biological allies in the Caribbean. I'm not giving up my biological allies in the South Pacific. I'm not giving up my biological allies in Australia. You is a damn fool to let somebody convince you that you should disassociate from all your African kith and kin around the world so you can beg the white man for some crumbs. You are out of your mind. But guess what? You belong there. I want you to stay in those groups. And by the way, brothers and sisters, no disrespect to none of you. If you belong to either one of those African-American tribal groups, if you belong to either one of those fraudulent African-American tribalism groups, you will not be allowed on the campus of the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy. In fact, for all my Pan-Africanists out there, for all of my Pan-Africanists out there, when you come to FDMG, if you spot one of those African-American tribalist groups, members out there, Anybody who say they're not from Africa, you're not allowed at my school. We don't teach that. I want to say it again. I want to make sure y'all understand me. So nobody's, nobody's angry when you get escorted off the campus. If you are not from Africa, you do not belong at my school for any reason. It is a pan-African nationalist institution. If you do not ascribe to the teachings of Pan-Africanism, of African solidarity, of race first, of African family first, if you are not unapologetically African, you are not allowed at my school. I want to be clear with you. I want to be clear. And I'm counting on my Pan-Africanists out there that if you catch any of them, I'm not from Africa people at any event, you catch any of those I'm not from Africa people at any event, please show me who they are so I can kindly throw their asses off Ifatunde Avenue. Please show me who they are so they can kindly be escorted off of Dr. Papa Boulevard. I am an African. I was born it. I'm going to live it. I'm going to die it. That is my flag. 
It is red, it is black, it is green. It was given to me in August of 1920 from Marcus Garvey and the Pan-Africanist who attended the first international convention of the African peoples of the world in Madison.